Good evening all and welcome to day three of Nature Week. It's going to be a good one as we hit you up with camping stories tonight. Tomorrow we've got skinwalkers and I'm going to finish strong with middle of nowhere on Friday and a big cryptid compilation for Saturday. So you're not going to want to miss it. Be sure to be subscribed and tune in every day at roughly the same time for even more. But for now it's time to get comfortable and let the darkness take control. In summer of 2019, my partner and I decided to take a road trip to Vancouver, Canada, and then stay at the Golden Ears Provincial Park. We liked camping, had spring break, and decided to do something different and make the most of our vacation. My partner had never been out of the US, and it seemed like a crazy new experience. With Airbnbs in each state, and the grand finale was a reserved campsite at Golden Ears, and it was close to the water Alouette Lake. We packed terribly, had a giant tent, brought a bunch of fruit and veg to eat healthy snacks, stored them in the cooler that was too small, and brought a cutting board with a knife to break up the snacks while driving. We started in California, switched off driving our bright red Ford Fiesta. We drove through Oregon and Washington and made it to Vancouver. We spent a day or two in each state, drank a little too much and stayed out late. Canada was the best part, and Alouette Lake felt like walking into a painting. We walked barefoot on the rocks with our toes in the freezing cold lake. We hiked around, saw a beautiful waterfall where we saw a couple taking pics of each other for over an hour, and we started modelling the same poses from far away. Everything was perfect, and the campsite was empty except for that other couple. We went to bed early that night. It was quiet, and I woke up to crackling outside my tent. My partner was snoring and still asleep, and I didn't think much of it, because it was pitch black and probably an animal. The crackling continued closer to the tent, and I sat up and grabbed my phone. The brightness came on, and I turned it off, almost blinding myself with light. But in those two seconds, I could make out a person right outside our tent. I froze and sat up. They weren't moving, and were close enough to unzip the tent if they wished. I started poking my partner, because I had no idea what to do. They woke up, and I said there was someone outside the tent. Then I heard footsteps, quiet footsteps, walking out the campsite. My partner starts saying loudly, What? Repeatedly in the sleepy haze. A car truck is parked right outside our camping area, and no one is near our campsite. It starts up, and then just drives off. They didn't turn their headlights on until they turned a corner, and we were out of view. So I couldn't make out much, but it looked like a truck. Now I'm shaking, and my partner can't put together what's happening. I want to leave, but Golden Ear locks the gates until 6 or 7 a.m., and it's 1 a.m., so here we're going to be. I make us move to the Ford Fiesta and sleep in the tightly packed car. She falls asleep immediately and thinks I'm paranoid. Could it have been a park ranger? It seemed too weird of a behavior for a park ranger and I sit there wide awake for two hours. The car is locked and I want to sleep but I can't. I'm in the passenger seat, my partner in the driver's seat to sleep. It's 3 a.m. I'm sitting half awake and I hear a car slowly driving up the road lights off as it rounds the corner. It had to be the same truck, and I was scared, but my adrenaline was pumping. It slowly rounds the corner and pulls up directly in front of our campsite again, in the same spot. I feel like I'm going to throw up. I had no weapon, but the kitchen knife we bought for the fruit and veggies, so I grabbed the knife and tried to make myself look angry, crazy, and big. I sit up in the passenger seat holding the kitchen knife. I keep it straight at eye level and stared deadpan out the truck in the pitch darkness, just like the father in the American Gothic painting. The truck stops and turns off. A light shines directly into my face coming from inside the truck. I stare back, terrified, in my bright Ford Fiesta holding a large kitchen knife not blinking. The truck starts up and turns on its lights, and they stay on, blinding me, and the truck pulls out and turns around and goes back to where it came from. My heart pounding, and I wake up my partner and say we need to get the hell out of there. We pack by just throwing things in the car and sit there until 6am. We drive home, 
and don't stop. We keep rehatching and trying to make sense of the situation and ultimately decide we both needed some sleep. This happened in August of 2013. I was camping in far north Queensland, Australia, in a place called Barham Falls, which is northwest of Cairns. I, a 21-year-old girl, was camping with my two male friends who were backpacking from Estonia, Theo and Charlie. We set up camp at a not official campsite. Rather, we walked along the tourist path, climbed over a railing, followed a train track for a few kilometers, and eventually veered off into the dense forest downhill to the river. It certainly wasn't easy to get to this area, and there wasn't any mobile phone service. Theo knew about it from friends who had shown him previously. The site was beautiful. We were surrounded by a tropical forest, and we were only a short walk upstream from the waterfall. After setting up camp, we walked to the waterfall where both Theo and Charlie plunged from the cliff into the water below. I decided not to follow. I was, and still am, scared of heights and the possibility of hurting myself. I sat and watched them for a while before eventually deciding to return to camp and read my book. I was totally relaxed, enjoying the serenity, taking in the beauty around me. What had been an exciting, adventurous day was interrupted by a deep, sinister laughter coming from the forest surrounding our campsite. Instantly alerted, I felt chills run through my body as I scanned the forest, trying to detect where the laughter had come from. But there was nothing. I tried to forget about it, convince myself that my mind was playing tricks on me. Theo and Charlie returned and told me that they had forgotten fire lighters for the campfire. They said that they'd need to travel to the nearest store to buy some and that I should just wait at camp. I told them that I didn't feel comfortable staying at camp, but didn't mention the laughter I had heard before. I didn't want them to think I was stupid, and for context at the time, I had quite a large crush on Charlie. Stupidly, I wanted him to think I was cool, and they told me it would be fine, that they would be back before dark. Reluctantly, I agreed and let them go. It was around 4 p.m., and I continued reading my book. I began thinking about it and realized that the walk back to the cars would be about half an hour, so they'd be gone for a little over an hour. At this time of year, dusk would be around 5.30 p.m. or so, and I would there likely be alone in a remote area in the dark. I distracted myself with my book, but as dusk began to settle and the darkness take control, I struggled to read the pages and fear began to set in. About an hour after, I started to hear footsteps in the forest. My first thoughts were that Theo and Charlie had returned, and I was instantly relieved that I was no longer alone. I listened for their voices but heard nothing. My heart dropped. It dawned on me that it may not be them, and I began to panic. Then came the laughter. The same, deep, sinister laughter I'd heard before, only this time it seemed much closer. I sprung to my feet and surveyed the forest, and then I saw him. He was standing on the other side of the stream which was connected to the river, standing on a log. What I saw was absolutely bizarre. He was wearing an immaculate tuxedo with a top hat and all. I remember being puzzled as to how he was able to get to this area in such clean and formal clothes. And at first I thought he may be an apparition, or that I was hallucinating. I did a double take and I was not. I then studied the man's face. It's hard to describe, but he appeared to have suffered from severe burns and had deep scarring covering his face. His hair was shoulder length, very wiry and unkempt. He laughed, that same laugh I'd heard from the forest. It came from him. We stared at each other for what felt like minutes. I had planned to sprint into the forest if he charged at me and observed that the small creek between us would at least slow him down. He then spoke. What are you doing here all alone? With an unsettling smile. Luckily, I was able to remain calm and told him I was camping with my friends and that they had just gone to get supplies and would be back shortly. The man laughed again. He asked me how long we'd be there for. 
I lied and said we were leaving the next day. It seemed as if the man wanted to provoke a reaction out of me, or that he wanted me to panic and run, and that he wanted to chase me. But I remained calm, and acted as if we were having a standard conversation. I think this confused him. Miraculously, I heard Theo and Charlie's voices approaching. The man seemed alarmed, and said that he saw someone else camping upstream, and that he was going to check on them. He left, and minutes later, Theo and Charlie returned. I immediately told them what happened and they laughed and thought I was making it up, and that it was a lame attempt to scare them. Tears began to gather in my eyes, and Charlie realized I was serious. Theo didn't seem phased. He was a very stereotypical backpacker and had the carefree nature travelers tend to have. Charlie, however, assured me I would be okay and had me sleep between him and Theo for the next two nights. I barely slept at all those nights, listening out for laughter, but fortunately never heard it again. For years I searched online for any reports of similar encounters and never found a thing, but I have always contemplated what would have happened if Theo and Charlie hadn't returned at that moment. I shuddered the thought. I would love to hear what you guys think that the man's intentions were, and if I was right to be terrified. Understandably, I haven't been camping since. I was nine when this happened. My sister, dad, and stepmom were all in a place with me called Palmetto Island. It was a camping resort where you just pull up with a tent or camper and stay there for a weekend or so. We were in a camper, and before I get to the actual story, I should set the scene. Palmetto Island wasn't really an island in the traditional sense. It was completely surrounded by palm trees and vegetation, except for the road in and out. There were roads in the resort, but they were only for golf carts and other smaller vehicles. The whole place was also dense with palm trees and vegetation. If you weren't on the road in a campsite or at one of the recreational areas, you would be in a forest. So we, my family, were all hanging out at one of the playgrounds. We made a new friend who I was playing with. At some point, the rest of my family had left me to play with my new friend. Eventually, he left too. And I was there alone as the sun was beginning to set. This wasn't the first time we'd been to Palmetto Island, and I had at that time got to know it pretty well. I'd assumed that the walk back to our campground would be short. However, at some point, I had gotten turned around and ended up in the area where you would usually launch boats into the water to go fishing. There was a group of people there, and I asked them for directions. Now, I wasn't completely brain dead, so I lied and said the number of our campsite was 10 sites down from our actual one. They pointed me in the right direction, and I began to walk. Now, I hadn't known this at the time, but my family had realized that I was no longer at the playground and started driving around in our golf cart and another one they had rented. If they hadn't, I probably wouldn't be telling this story. As I'm walking towards our campsite, a car pulls up besides me, and one of the people I had asked for directions rolls down the window. Keep in mind, I had been walking about an hour or two in total. He offers me a ride and tells me to ride the front seat. Me, tired and wary from walking, accepts and gets in the car. I know now that this is something you should never do. We were driving in the right direction until he passes up the entrance by the campsites, at which point I know something is wrong. I tell him he passed it, but he doesn't reply. By some stroke of divine luck, I see my dad in a golf cart driving in the opposite direction at us, and I start yelling and waving at him. He pulls up in front of the car and stops, and so does the guy driving. I use the manual unlock in the car door and run to my dad, who has his concealed carry drawn on the guy as soon as I'm out the way. He calls the police and holds the guy at gunpoint until they get there and arrest him. I'm only now telling this story, because I found out last week that the guy and his whole family had done this before and had gotten away with it. I try not to think about what would have happened to me had my dad not showed up when he did. About five years ago, my wife and I went on a weekend camping trip with our two closest friends, another married couple. The campsite is just outside of Yosemite and absolutely beautiful. 
the beauty of it and creepiness of it is that you take a dirt road for about an hour and a half off the main road to get to it. It's extremely secluded, but never felt threatening. It's a really popular campsite, so there were always people around, especially in the summer when this occurred. The first day was awesome. I don't remember exactly what we did, but I remember having a great time. The campsites are all fairly close together, and usually separated by various shrubs. I remember we were all pretty pumped about the site we got, as there were no neighbors on one side, just forest, and no one occupying the site closest to us. This is uncommon, as these campgrounds stay fully booked throughout the summer. Day two started normally. We had breakfast, then headed to the lake for a few hours. The lake was about a 20 minute hike from the main campground. When we got back around two-ish, we noticed that the site next to us now had a silver rental car parked on it. We didn't think much of it and went about making a fire to cook with. At some point, we noticed the occupant of the site next to us, a pretty average looking white dude, maybe in his early 40s. Honestly, he was so average looking that it's hard to picture him. We all immediately caught on to the fact that he was constantly looking over at us. My friend Dave even made a comment to me under his breath. You know the guy keeps looking over here. I remember feeling a little uncomfortable as we were all still in bathing suits from the lake but made a conscious effort to ignore it. It's worth mentioning that we were a little buzzed, not out of control or anything, just feeling pretty good. Throughout the afternoon and into the evening, we continued to notice the guy constantly looking over at us. In hindsight, Dave or I really should have called him out. This story doesn't make us look great, but whatever. I had been stressed at work prior to the trip and really didn't want to let some creepy dude throw off my relaxed vibe. The alcohol, coupled with the fact that we honestly kind of felt bad for him, led us to not confront him. Yes, it was very creepy, but I told myself he was just an awkward and lonely dude. Aside from the staring, there was a couple of mildly weird incidents that occurred leading up to the very weird stuff. The first was that at some point, he left to go and do whatever. While he was gone, a girl in her mid-twenties walked by and snapped a picture of his license plate. I remember asking her if she needed anything, and she smiled awkwardly and kept walking. Dave and I both thought this was odd, but we were preoccupied with beer. Later into the evening around seven, the camp host was doing her rounds, checking people in. She checked us in and moved on to him. I remember all of us eavesdropping intently to hear what they were saying. I think we just wanted to hear what this creep sounded like. He kept asking questions about the bathhouse. We didn't know there was a bathhouse or even what a bathhouse was, but he had like a hundred different questions about it. Where is it? How late is it open? Is it private? Maybe not that weird, but in context, definitely strange. The sun began going down. We were all drunk, so we weren't too concerned with the creepy dude anymore. At one point, we went for a walk and noticed him snooping around what we believed to be the bathhouse. Now I would call this kind of behavior odd, but again, I was drunk and five years stupider at the time. We all laughed and talked about how creepy he was. Back at the site, we continued to drink and have a good time. At one point, the guy starts eating beans aggressively out of the can in the light of his single lantern and looked at us while doing so. And Dave and I kind of sniggered to each other about how strange it was. I don't think the girls noticed. Eventually, we decided to go to bed. I think the guy had left his sight at this point and I kind of remember us making jokes like, I better not wake up to that dude in our window. My wife and I slept in our SUV with the seats folded down. Dave and Sarah slept in their camper shell of their truck, and I remember feeling a little creeped out as I fell asleep, but tried shrugging it off. At around 2.30 a.m., both my wife and I were jolted awake by what we thought was a woman's scream. We both looked at each other and asked if the other had heard that. We came to the conclusion that it was probably some people on the other side being loud and decided to try and go back to sleep. As I was trying to go back to sleep, 
I began feeling very unsettled and decided to get out of the car and take a look around. I cracked my door, trying to be as quiet as possible. I had gotten about one leg out of the car when I heard a faint but direct whispering coming from Dave and Sarah's camper shell about four feet away. I froze, and then I heard it again. Eventually, I realized that they were trying to tell me something and I whispered back, What? Then I very clearly heard Dave say, Start your car. I instantly realized that something was wrong, so rather than ask questions, I climbed back into my car to start it. Right away, Dave and Sarah burst out the back of their camper and frantically jumped into my car and told me to drive. They were too freaked out to explain anything, so I just drove kind of aimlessly. Eventually, I pulled over, figuring we were far enough from whatever had freaked them out. Finally, Sarah calmed down enough to tell us what happened. As she put it, she was awoken by a light coming from the creepy dude's campsite. Apparently, he had set up lanterns and flashlights to spot himself, completely naked, getting himself off in the direction of our cars. She also mentioned that he was flaccid and not able to finish. A gross detail, but I feel like it's important, as it gets weirder. At some point, he stopped and turned off the lights and began using a flashlight to signal across to a small ravine that the campsite backs up to. I'm talking like Morse code or something. Across the ravine, an old RV begins using its headlights to signal back. Dave was awake at that point, and I questioned them on this detail. And they both said it was very clear that they were communicating. After that, he shut off his light. Keep in mind, it's absolutely pitch black out there at night. After a few minutes, they heard footsteps around their car, followed by a hard tap on the window, which is what caused Sarah to scream, hence me waking up. At that point, I decided that we needed to call the police. The problem was there was absolutely zero cell service at the campsite. Furthermore, it was about an hour and a half up a service road from what was already a very remote part of the state, so leaving it that night was not an option. We decided the best course of action was to alert the camp host and drove around and eventually found the trailer she lived in. She was understandably confused to be awoken at 3.30 in the morning but was responsive. She mentioned that the guy was really weird when she checked him in and called the police on her satellite phone. Apparently there was a massive wildfire burning that weekend and the police said they wouldn't be able to send anyone out till sunrise. The camp host said there really wasn't anything she could do beyond calling the police. It really sucked hearing that. Basically, we were stuck in our car in the pitch darkness while some crazy wanking dude was out and about, not to mention whoever was in that RV. One more really weird thing happened. At around 4am we were still sitting in my car when a man in a hood walked right up to the window. The second I noticed him I switched on the engine and headlights and he ran off into the trees. We all sat in the car until sunrise. Once it was light out, we went back to the site to pack things up. His car was there with blankets hung all in the windows. The whole thing just felt gross. And we wanted to get the hell out of there so we quickly packed up and left. A few hours later I got a call from the police. They said they went out to the campsite and questioned the guy. He said he was simply showering. The cop told me there was nothing he could do. It was our word against his. He also questioned the people in the RV. They said they didn't know what he was talking about but mentioned, and I quote, a very rude camper screamed in the middle of the night. The whole experience with the police was frustrating. I tried following up and even tried to get help from a family member who's a sheriff, but he even said there wasn't anything they could do unless that particular police chief really wanted to investigate the guy. And that's the story. I learned a lesson about being polite when people make you uncomfortable. Nowadays, I'm much more aggressive with creepy people. I also know it's easier to hear this story and wonder why Dave and myself didn't confront the guy, especially when he's literally tugging one out in the car you're sleeping in. I don't know. I wish we would have shown more courage, but honestly, it was really scary in the moment. I'm okay with admitting that. Now I think it's kind of funny how stupid we were and how bizarre the whole situation was and fortunate that no one was hurt. Clearly we were dealing with a very messed up individual who had accomplices. I can only imagine what their end goal was and what they would have been capable of doing. I also think that they'd done stuff like this before. 
and I really wish the police could have helped in some way, but alas. I'm a 23-year-old female and was recently in Africa on vacation with my family and we stayed two nights at a desert camp in the Sahara. The first night, my sister and I were talking and hanging out with these guys who worked there and they were all around our age, maybe 20 to 35. It seemed they were just friendly and harmless. I noticed at the campfire that night that one of the guys started paying more attention to me and I felt a little uncomfortable but figured it was just a language barrier or something. So out in the desert, you can see the stars really well, and even the Milky Way on clear nights. But you have to wait for the moon to go down, which is around 2 a.m. I guess it's a normal thing for the guys to come out around the tents, which are luxury furnished tents with beds, lights and toilets and showers, as well as locks on the doors, and knocked on the door to see if you're awake and wanted to come out and see the stars. My sister and I were sharing a tent, my parents in a separate one across the walkway. The first night around midnight, I told my sister I was too tired to go out because I was falling asleep, so she left to look at the stars without me. And I didn't lock the door because I didn't want her to get locked out if I fell asleep, which I surely would have. Fast forward about an hour, and I'm on my side, asleep, when I wake up suddenly to see a head peeking in from the tent door. I thought it was my sister, so I groggily asked her, What are you doing? Because it was just weird the way she was standing there. I started to wake up more and realized it was the guy's head from the campfire peeking his head into my room while I was asleep. Now, I know it could have been a simple misunderstanding, but I felt completely violated with my privacy, especially because we were on their territory in the middle of the desert, and I'm not kidding, we had to take a half hour truck ride into the dunes just to get there. I was in fight or flight at that moment. He literally woke me up with a panic attack, and I was starting to get very nervous. So I went to the door and told him I was tired, and he kept on trying to get me to come out to the dunes with a blanket. Classic male move but I kept saying no, that I didn't feel good and I was tired. At this moment, I don't know where my sister is. I don't know where my family is. I'm disoriented as hell. And all I know is that this man standing in front of me was watching me sleep. I don't know for how long he had been there. It could have been a second, it could have been minutes, but either way, I was high key horrified. I told him no again and said I'd go look at the stars tomorrow night. He told me that he wouldn't be at the camp the next night and that's why he wanted to go out tonight, but I wouldn't budge. Once he realized I wasn't gonna come outside, he asked me if he could have my number and I told him no, that I had a boyfriend. I didn't, but it seemed like the only way this guy would respect my disinterest by knowing there was another man in the picture. After I said that, he asked for my first name and I gave it to him because I thought it wouldn't do any harm. And then I said goodnight and locked the door. I went to the bathroom and had diarrhea. He literally scared the crap out of me. And while I was on the toilet, I heard him come back and start calling my name from outside the tent. But I stayed quiet and didn't say anything. I finished up in the bathroom and lay down in bed, still trying to calm down from what had just happened because my heart was racing. I heard him come back, calling my name again. I laid in bed as still as I could and didn't say a word. I tried texting my dad, but he was not answering, and I didn't feel comfortable leaving the tent. Finally, my sister came back, and my dad was with her. So I told them what had just happened, and they were confused and thought it was weird, and that was kind of it. The next day, I brought it up at breakfast again, and my sister and dad basically told me I was being dramatic, and that I should stop talking about it, because it really wasn't that big of a deal. My mum was the only one who was like, yeah, that's not okay at all. The second night, my sister and I were both out under the stars, talking to the guys and relaxing. Keep in mind it's very dark and you can't see any faces, so I was having a normal conversation with one guy and I couldn't see him. After a while, he asks if I remember him and I'm like, no, well I can't see you, so he shines a light. And wouldn't you guess it's the same one from my tent. I especially wasn't expecting him to be the dude in front of me because he told me he wouldn't be there that night, which leads me to believe he picked up a shift just to see me, but I can't be sure. But surprisingly, he was fine that night and respected my boundaries. So I didn't say anything to the guys who ran the camp. I was planning on doing so if he did anything remotely uncomfortable, but he didn't. 
The next morning we left the area, and for a few days later I started getting message requests on Instagram. Would you believe this guy found me? I tagged the whole entire desert, like you're telling me he found me on my name and a location. Not even a specific location, the entire desert. My name's not unique either. He messages me, and although I'm creeped out, I'm thinking, okay, well, he's harmless now. Might as well see what he says. He says, direct quote, You know, I'm really happy to find your account. I was looking all the time, which I found highly creepy to say to someone. But again, it could just be a cultural difference. I didn't answer, and he messaged me again a few days later, saying, Hey, how are you? But yeah. I'm curious to think if you guys think I'm simply overreacting, or if I was right in telling this guy to get lost. It could have just been harmless, but still. I've had two different scary encounters that I wish to discuss. The first was camping near Tesuke, about an hour from Santa Fe. On a weeknight, it was quite cold, and I was supposed to leave early in the morning for Texas, and it was forecast to snow. Being the young genius that I was, I slept in my Jeep to negate all these. Middle of the night, an SUV quite literally skids to a stop in the gravel in my campground. This wakes me up, and I'm on edge. The SUV is blasting mariachi music incredibly odd, but I figured these people were just drunk or high. The doors open, these people get out and start running through the woods screaming bloody murder, and I mean these people sound like they're gonna die. I'm at an absolute utter loss. Maybe a minute or two later, everything gets suddenly quiet, and I don't hear them anymore. Tucked into my sleeping bag, I started to absolutely crap myself. I'm sitting here, cramped up in the back of my Jeep, wishing and praying them away. I don't know how long it was. I dared not look at my phone, but eventually I heard quiet voices around my Jeep. The only thing I caught was, do you think someone's in there? As you can imagine, I absolutely lost my call. I just started screaming and crawled as fast as I could to the front seat where I turned the light on and stuck the key in the ignition. As I looked up, I see these people scattering away like roaches in the trees and down the mountainside. Ever since, I kept a J-frame revolver in my center console whenever I travel. The state permit is recognized in a lot of places, so it's a nice luxury to have. The second was in the city of Little Rock, Arkansas. I was heading to Oklahoma from the East Coast to visit family for Christmas. I was too cheap to pay for a hotel, so I got off I-40, parked behind a hotel and slept in my Jeep. The middle of the night, I get awoken by the sound of a small scraping noise. Confused, I open my eyes to see a figure outside, attempting to work the zipper of my soft top. Horrified, I simply sat there. It wasn't until they managed to stick their hand through the small opening they had created that I reached out, grabbed the nearest thing to me, which was a Coleman lantern, and smashed their hand with it. Without waiting to see the result of this, I jumped into the front seat, worked the ignition, and peeled out of the hotel parking lot, faster than I think I've ever left anywhere else. I didn't stop for gas, red lights, breakfast, or anything just merged straight onto the I-40 and continued west for almost 30 miles. Needless to say, it was the last time I ever slept in my Jeep. I was dragged out of a tent in my sleep by a pack of dingoes on Fraser Island in Australia. I woke up to a weird feeling at my feet and saw that they were chewing on my toes through the sleeping bag. One of them was standing on my hip slash stomach, staring at me in the face. Now I'm not a fighter, but I hit him such a punch on the side of the head, like the perfect right cross to his cute little face, he went flying sideways, which spooked all of the others, about four or five, and with a few kicks from my bagged up legs, they scurried away. I went back to the tent to find my then girlfriend asleep, still snoring away. The next morning, I went over to our tour guide fella, massive Aussie dude called Tony, and told him what happened, and he asked, Did you see which one it was? And funnily enough, I did. He had a yellow-blue tag in his ear, as they're all tagged on the island. 
and I remember because they're the Wicklow colours, where I'm from, and Tony just said, ah yeah, that one's a prick. I ended up punching quite a bit of wildlife in my year there, but Australia definitely started it. This happened to a group of friends and I on a camping expedition for an award programme. It was the second day and we were coming to the end of a six hour walk. We were walking across a small country road. The nearest house was pretty far behind us and way out of earshot. At the end of the country road was a bridle ray that ran perpendicular, probably about two miles from a nearby village. As we were approaching the bridle way, an unmarked white van came up the road and instead of stopping, he pulled up in front of us. The width of the van was about that of the country road, so couldn't get past. He rolled down his window and started asking us questions. It wasn't uncommon for locals to ask us questions or give us words of encouragement, but this guy didn't sit right with me. Being an all-female group, and not to mention all of us incredibly exhausted, this was a concern of mine, but I brushed it off since it didn't seem to concern anyone else. I figured I just watched too many true crime documentaries. He asked what we were doing, as many people had, and we explained the award program we were on. His questions began relatively normal and small talkish, but they began to get more specific. You're camping out tonight then? We replied and said that we were, ready for him to drive off so that we could continue our route. Where's your campsite? This specifically sent shivers down my spine. This may not have been anything sinister, but that was none of his business. I feigned ignorance, as if I didn't know where the campsite was, and gestured vaguely in the opposite direction of the site, again just expecting him to shrug it off and go about his day. But no. Surely you must know where your campsite is. This is where one of my friends blurted out the name of the campsite. I froze for a second, but luckily he didn't hear this. He managed to ask us questions like, Is it that way? What does it look like? This was far too specific for my liking, so I maintained I had no idea. Eventually, looking strangely disappointed without saying anything, he began to drive away. We waited until he was way down the road before we continued walking, a little shaken. We made it back to the campsite and reported it to the counsellor. I hardly got any sleep that night. Perhaps I was overreacting, but I dread to think what might have happened. I'm a 29-year-old man, and three times a year I head up to the Georgia mountains to camp, fish, and have a great time. But after the last trip, I don't think I will do it again. I had been super excited the week before that I was going to head up to Georgia, when the day finally came, and I could have died with happiness. I loaded up my dog Buddy and all my gear and started the trip. About an hour into my trip, I saw a road that I'd never been on before. I decided I would take an hour to look around and go back to the main road. I lost track of time, and before I knew it the sun was setting. I grabbed my gear and buddy, and we hiked about ten minutes before finding a nice clearing in the forest. I set up camp and looked around. That's when I saw a small man-made trail leading into the dark trees, and decided that me and buddy needed a walk. I grabbed my walking stick, buddy's leash, and the headlamp and we headed into the trail. I knew something was wrong when I couldn't hear a single insect or animal. Buddy and I stopped at a little creek when I saw something terrifying. Two eyes reflecting from my headlamp. This thing was about six or seven feet tall and the eyes were too large to be that of a human. My dog is usually very protective of me but instead of barking on doing something, he whimpered and peed on my leg. I've never seen him act like this before. He's seen bears before and has scared mountain lions away, but never peed. As Buddy kept whimpering, I felt terrible, like this thing could rip me to shreds if it wanted to. Then it made the scariest noise I've ever heard. The best way to describe it is like a manic scream. Buddy and I bolted back to our camp, and from there we could still hear the thing. Needless to say, I wasn't staying there. I packed up my camp as Buddy stood watch. We ran to my truck and got out of there, and I went straight home and didn't sleep the whole night. I looked on the internet to what it could have been making the noise, but nothing came close, and I don't really know what it was. I just know there's something strange in the forests of Georgia. 
This happened my junior year of high school, back when my friends were 16 to 17, so at least 10 years ago now. Some background on the story, of course. Me and my friends, John, Lily and Luke. John was my significant other at the time, and Luke and Lily were a couple also. So we were a group of two boys and two girls. We all lived in Idaho and went to the same high school together. We had this grand idea of all wanting to go camping together, and after a few weekends of this not working out, and the weather getting colder and cooler, we made mandatory plans that we would have to go camping on what could easily be the last somewhat nice weekend there was. After some decision making, we planned to go up the road called 8th Street that leads directly into a national forest and spend the night there. Jen and I had been up there a few weeks ago as an after school adventure and found it to be a pretty nice place. We even had some nice looking camp spots in mind. That weekend, I believe we left Saturday afternoon, we gathered up camp supplies, took my suburban Luke's Jeep, my dog Bella, and headed to the base of 8th Street. This was a whole adventure in itself, because what starts out as paved roads became four-wheel drive terrain about 20 minutes in, which is always fun, picking our way over rocks and large trenches caused by rain. The surrounding wilderness changes drastically too. In about 45 minutes, you move from the middle of downtown to the middle of the foothills, to a large pine forest. Idaho's like that. It's very easy to escape the city, just drive an hour in any direction away, and you're basically in the middle of nowhere. We had planned to leave earlier in that day, but since we were unorganized, we left a lot later than expected. Meaning, we got up to the top of 8th as it was becoming dusk. I'll explain what the location looks like in a bit. Basically, going up 8th means exactly that. Up. To the top of one of the mountains that looks over the city. We made our way onto what is a dirt road that travels along a pretty wide range of mountain and went to the spot that John and I had found earlier. To our dismay, we could see cars and a fire there. Someone had taken our spot. So we continued down the road, farther than John and I had explored the last time we were there, hoping to find another spot. We were getting a little down because the road seemed to be winding down the other side of the ridge into the forest and we wanted to be on the top of the ridge to see the city. Finally, we found a spot. It was perfect. We parked our cars, started a fire, and popped some beers, the whole shebang. The spot needs to be described a bit for the story. So picture a tiny hill with the top half shaved off to make a flat area, but the side where the road leads to the top is a bit taller, almost like a half crater. This hill was on top of the mountain range, and the main road we had been following winded around the base of a hill and continued along. It's obvious the place had been used as a campsite many times before. Old fire, glass, shot shells, other side notes. When you're driving up the top part of the hill, it's very steep, and you can't see the flat area till after your car comes over the edge of the crater-like hill. Even when you drive the main road round the base of the hill, you can't really see where people are camping. So basically, after you slowly creep up the hill and are brave enough to continue over the edge, that makes you pretty convinced that you could be driving off the side of a cliff. Your car rolls over the edge and you see a flat part of the hill. But the sight is not bad after that. Look towards the city and you can see down the mountain. Look the other way and you can see a big valley of trees and more mountains. So about an hour in, Lily and Luke decide to take a walk and follow the main road some more. I don't know why. To me, this was a crazy idea. John and I were way too scared of the dark to do this, but they being freaks of nature walked off down the road. John and I chilled by the fire with the dog for a bit, but slowly, without Luke and Lily, we both get spooked. A few times we decided that we should head down the road and follow our friends. We tried this a few times but would get spooked and race back up the road, up our little hill, and to the site. Once we gave up with that idea, we climbed to the top of my suburban with a blanket. 
I guess being up there felt safer, so the bogeymen couldn't get to us, or at least we could see them approaching if they tried. We started to notice that they had been gone a long time, and the fire would be running out of wood. We wanted to wait for them to get wood with, but it seemed like they weren't coming back any time soon, so we started working on gathering the wood by ourselves. Of course, being idiot kids, we didn't bring an axe. What we did bring was a hatchet, a Rambo knife, and a machete. Odd, I know, but having these things is kind of normal in Idaho. So we gathered up those things for chopping wood and for protection, bundled up a bit and started to head over to the base of a big pine tree. It was then we could hear an engine from somewhere deep in the valley that we could also see headlights way down below of. It was quiet, so it was pretty easy to hear. I guess the road we took is the same road they were on, just much further down. Curious, we watched as they winded up. They eventually came into view and drove under our little hill, not super odd, although it was pretty late. But whatever, they passed below the hill and we expected to see them along the road. But as they rounded our hill, their brake lights turned on and began to make their way up our hill on the steep side road. Uh, okay. I guess that's a bit odd, because they couldn't really see us driving along the road. They would drive up and over the little ridge, see us camping and drive off, knowing they drove straight into someone's camp by accident. The truck, a giant white brand new looking ram, rolls over the ridge and its headlights flood the whole campsite. Like deer in headlights we stare. To our surprise they move a little more forward, so they are pretty solidly over the ridge. Then they park, and the engine dies and the headlights turn off. We're standing, just staring at this odd truck that pulled into the campsite, the fire positioned between us and the car, and they're about 15 feet from the fire and us, about the same distance on the other side. We must look insane. We have jackets with hoods on, holding a collection of weapons, staring at this truck. I'm telling you, if I had pulled into that campsite and saw us, I would have floored the hell out of there. Meanwhile, my dog Bella, a black and white Springer Spaniel, is going crazy with the new intruders, running around the front of the truck, barking and growling and just losing it. A person hops out the driver's seat. A man and a lady hop out of the passenger side a few seconds later. They completely ignore my dog. I mean, she's not huge, only like 45 pounds, but still, I would have at least been wary of a dog acting like that. Without saying a word, they just walk up to our fire and stand there. We haven't moved. The man says hi at this point. He seems overly friendly, talking to us like we're good friends, but goes on about how he used to love camping in this exact spot as a kid. Talks about how a tree grew nearby and that he remembers being itty bitty. He asks how we're doing. We're kind of weirded out, so just give short answers and are trying to figure out what's going on and who this man was. I noticed he was very clean cut, thin and wearing nice shoes, jeans and a North Face jacket. He didn't look like he'd been camping. I was focused on the man so I couldn't really describe his wife, if she even was his wife. She didn't say a word, just sat there. I don't remember him introducing himself, but a few things he said did stand out. At one point, he brings up that he saw two kids down the road a bit and asks us if we know them. We say we do and that they're our friends and on a walk. Meanwhile, I'm looking at his truck, expecting to see one of our friend's lifeless hands hanging out of the bed or something. And at another point, I had answered his question about how we were doing by saying we were a little spooked, to which he responds me with, I have a gun that you could shoot, if that makes you feel any better. I tell him no thanks, I didn't really want guns out. Plus, who goes shooting at night? He asks if we have guns. I tell him no. Right after saying this, I realize it was the wrong thing to say and kick myself for doing so. So now we're standing here talking with a random guy by our fire, which is currently dying. His overly nice demeanor is creeping me out, so I kind of say to them that we need to go get wood, and the man offers us a flashlight that he has in his truck. I tell him we're good, and we use headlamps, and we wander down the hill over to a tree. We're scouting around looking for wood, and I'm telling John how absolutely weird this is. John does not usually camp, so for all he knows, this is perfectly normal behavior. Although, he agrees, 
that the man kind of scares him. I explained that people never, and I mean never, come up to someone's camp like this in the middle of the night when we're in the middle of the woods, and or even a campground. It's just plain rude. And lots of the time, people go camping to have peace and quiet. This is Idaho. Who in their right mind goes up to some random campsite? Only someone who has a death wish and is willing to get shot by some drunk, crazy redneck with a shotgun. I just don't understand how he'd do this when he wouldn't know what he'd stumble upon and came walking up to two people who were holding knives and had a dog, not asking permission or anything. Anyway, I just keep telling him it's weird. We come back up with a few branches and random sticks and throw them into the fire. I don't really remember if they said anything else, nothing of importance, because I failed to remember anything specific other than he wished us good night, got into his truck, reversed down the hill and continued on his way. Finally, Lily and Luke wander back and we frantically tell them what happened, relieved and kind of laughed it off as we were still alive, but kept reiterating how strange it was. We asked if they saw the truck and they said they did, that he stopped to ask if we were okay and they said yes and they were just on a walk and the truck left. We go back to sitting by the fire and enjoying the night when we hear the damn truck again coming back down the road the opposite way. I wander to the edge of the hill to watch and he drives past the road to our campsite and relief floods me. But then his brake lights come on. He stops, he reverses and goes up our little hill. This time I'm convinced he's coming to kill us. Again, the back of his truck rolls over the edge down the ledge and kind of evens out. The truck parks, turns off and out pops the man. I notice he now has a bunch of branches in the back of his truck. He excitedly announces he brought us some firewood. Uh, thanks? With us trying to drag this huge thing next to the fire. We thank him in a not sure kind of way. He says goodnight, smiles, hops back in and comes down the way he originally came up. We could hear his truck move back down the valley till he was gone. We didn't see or hear from him again. We were car camping and I made sure to lock all the doors and I didn't sleep that well, half expecting to hear the engine of the truck at any moment throughout the night. It was morning. We spent the day wandering, hiking up and down, and then headed in the late afternoon with no sign of the truck. I did tell my mum, she kind of freaked out, and now she doesn't let me go camping without a pistol. We had some ideas, maybe he was a forest ranger, or maybe someone looking for potential poachers, or an overly friendly good citizen. Who knows, but like I said, the whole situation made me feel quite strange, and that isn't how you act when you're out in the woods. But he never did pull anything, which matters. Hey guys, it's Mort here, and thank you so much for listening. That concludes day three of Nature Week with Camping Stories. I do hope you liked. Like I said, tomorrow I'm going to hit you up with some Skinwalker Stories. It's going to be good. And finish up with Middle of Nowhere for Friday and the big cryptid compilation on Saturday. You're going to love it. Be sure to subscribe and stick around for even more horror stories. Just want to say a huge thank you to my members and patrons. I actually just posted something on there for you guys. I hope you like it if you... You know, if you, if you have access to that, if you're a member or patron, you know, I hope you enjoy it. Um, but that's it. Here's another video on screen now. I love you guys so much, and I hope to see you again tomorrow. It's going to be big. Stay awesome, and I'll see you in the next one.